Good morning, dear professor and classmates. This is my presentation about Puritans, Church, and Worship. Browsing through the reading materials about Puritanism has left me in awe of who they were as the Lord's followers and worshipers. And they seem perfect. And I thought to myself, is there any flaw in their theology? Are the authors just being biased and writing overrated commentaries about them? So it was for me to find out about them by studying more about Puritanism. And I would say this is the first time that I'm going to do it. So I have heard about Puritans before, but not quite a lot. And I never wrote a paper about them nor research thoroughly about their theology. I would like to share about my background. Uh, it's actually quite mixed up because I got my graduate certificate from a certain Baptist uh, leadership center in my province. And then I completed my MA in a Pentecostal seminary in another province and uh, that seminary is actually an AG or Assemblies of God which we know that is uh, very Pentecostal. Now being at the onset of studying the Reformed theology on a deeper sense is letting me plunge into a different and wider theological perspective. So how do Puritans differ from Pentecostals and Baptists and other denominations, theologically speaking? Because we have learned that Puritanism is not a denomination, but a theological perspective. And uh, in the early era, it was a movement. So I am very interested to know and understand more, especially about how they view church and worship which is my topic for today's presentation so although i have heard about luther calvin swingley and other heroes of reformed theology in the past i have never had a chance to study the puritans maybe i had but was just not aware of it so it is a blessing to do it and honestly, I cannot identify with any denomination today. But from what I have read so far about Puritans, I think I am a Puritan by heart. <laughs> so let's, let's go to our presentation. I, I think that is enough for our introduction. So Puritans' view of church and worship. Puritanism having unique yet seemingly sound theological position has a lot to offer especially to the growing corruption in many churches today nonetheless it was not too perfect as it seemed when they failed in their goal for church reform perhaps it was not yet time and that the church was not yet prepared for the reformation now the great Thing about this movement is the commitment and passion for Christ and his truth that was displayed throughout their lives so before we go through the deeper understanding of their theology here is an overview of how the author theologian Leland Riken the author of our book how he wrote about the Puritans Number one, Puritans never constituted a separate denomination, as we have heard uh, from our professor. Puritans resorted to the strongest control at their disposal, the Bible. Puritans were a scattered presence in a broad expanse of affiliations. Most English Puritans remained within the Anglican Church, Puritans identified themselves as Presbyterians during certain eras of the movement. Puritans operated on the same principle of seeking biblical warrant for church practices. 
Puritans have their corporate worship and private worship. Puritan families organize their own Thanksgiving days and fast days. Puritans formulated a multiple biblical basis for Sabbath observance. So let's go to church. These two topics, the church and the worship, uh, actually overlaps. And uh, some things in my presentation may just sound worship and church because uh, this, these two topics, as I said, uh, are overlapping topics. So Puritans rejected Catholic and Anglican practices like uh, the vestments and extravagant rituals. Early Puritan named uh, William Turner said, Almighty God told his son Christ all loss that was necessary for Christ's church and Christ taught his apostles all that he heard from his father and all that the apostles learned from Christ necessary for Christ's church. They and the evangelist have written in the New Testament, which is the law of the gospel. But the evangelists and apostles have made no mention of the Pope's ceremonies, laws, and traditions. Therefore, they are not necessary for Christ's church. They are not necessary. But the law of the gospel is necessary alone. Turner trained a pet dog <laughs> to jump up and snatch the square cups from... Uh, the heads of the clerics isn't that funny <laughs> but he, he seriously did that so john bale on the other hand asserted that christ never wore cope cross candlestick and walked down a procession more so he never made holy water <laughs> or the holy bread that only of those whom he called the leaven of the pharisees and damnable hypocrisy. The Puritans indeed understand that God was always looking at the heart of the worshiper and not on the way the worship is presented. So the Puritans were conservative, uh, so to speak, when it comes to how church and worship has to be done and in accordance to what the Bible says. Uh, the scripture is central to them. So Puritans hated images in the church, which is very clear in the scripture. Iconic clash was their agenda. Iconic clash is uh, their destruction of the idols, of the images inside the church. It is not impressive buildings or fancy clerical vestments. It is instead the company of the redeemed, that is from, from the book in page 115. Puritans consider the sermon as central to their piety, as I have said earlier. And as we have discussed in the chapter about preaching, I think it was in uh, chapter 6, they value the sermon so much that it is not just a means of religious education, as what we are also doing today. But the most common way that God prepared a sinner's heart for conversion. So every Sunday and weekdays, the preaching, the liturgy is uh, shortened so that there is more time for preaching. So they attended uh, two sermons on every Sunday and then a couple of sermons uh, over the weekdays so considering that for us today that will be hard for many of us i guess because of the many agenda that we have that even sundays become very busy for us and we fail to honor the sabbath and most of us are guilty of this so, but unlike the Puritans, from whom we should learn, they were distinct for their adherence to Sabbatarianism or the Sabbath. 
let's uh, look at these pictures look at how the puritans devotedly go to the church together in spite of the long challenging walk that they had to take in some areas that have snow they even had to go through the cold and slippery road just to get to the church and praise the lord together so puritans devote the entire day of worship and consequently the avoidance of recreational activities within that day because they just commit the whole sunday uh, for the lord and they do it with all their heart their mind and soul it's not just plain attending but they devote everything they have their heart mind and soul now about the sacrament the two sacraments of puritans are the baptism and the lord's supper as we also do have today they agreed with child baptism but later disputed about it they objected to the prayers prayer books assertion of baptismal regeneration a lot of things were also rejected with regards to baptism like having godparents who made vows to give that responsibility to child's father signing of the cross during baptism baptizing dying infants because it implied that such sacrament contributed to salvation when the fact is it's not later the baptism was replaced by circumcision as a sign of the covenant and upon undergoing circumcision is the mark of the child's admission to the church so the puritans rejected transubstantiation by the roman catholics as we know and the sacramental union by the lutherans they also did not believe in confirmation the sacrament of confirmation of the catholics and thought it was not necessary and that the bishops did not have enough time to examine them so in spite of the passion and discipline sitting together the puritans still hold uh, they, they still hold on to the basic teaching of the scripture which is to do everything in love as god is love john calvin actually said this the master did not will the outward discipline and ceremonies to prescribe in detail what we ought to do because he foresaw that he depended on the state of the times and he did not deem one form suitable for ages because he has taught nothing specifically and because these things are not necessary to salvation and for the upbuilding of the church ought to be variously accommodated to the customs of each nation and age it will be fitting as the advantage of the church will require to change and abrogate traditional practices and to establish new ones indeed i admit that we ought not to change into innovation rashly suddenly for insufficient cause and listen to this but love will best judge what may hurt or edify and if we love i mean and if we let love be our guide all will be safe now remember who was talking here it's john calvin and as we know he's a very bold theologian and reformist and coming from him this gentle words it's, it's very powerful and the puritans hold to this that uh, even though they are very disciplined and that uh, they emphasize so much on on excellence and accuracy yet they are not forgetting the main thing which is love the love of god and the love the love for others that everything should be driven by god's love now there is no division between what is holy and what is secular for puritans as we have uh, been taught by our professor in the first days of our lectures so everything should be done for god 
Hence, worship is happening everywhere according to the Puritans. And I agree uh, to this. Uh, worship is happening everywhere, be it in public or in private. Martin Luther, now, Martin Luther said this, The worship of God should be free at table, in private rooms, downstairs, upstairs, at home, abroad, in all places, by all people, at all times. Whoever tells you anything else is lying as badly as the Pope and the devil himself. <laughs> he was always, you know, Martin Luther is always having this agenda to rebuke or correct the Roman Catholic Church. The Puritans carried through the simplification of freedom of worship in music and liturgy and even architecture. The architecture, you know, the Puritans permanent, permanently uh, changed according to the book by Riken. They changed uh, the church architecture for from the two-room principle in which members were onlookers as the clergy performed the liturgy to a one-room sanctuary wherein the people will just meet inside it. So, all of this they simplified uh, from the worship and music, liturgy, the architecture and everything because they want to avoid a very important error in the church and that is symbolism. Patrick Collinson summarizes Puritan theology and the practice by saying, the life of the Puritan was in one sense a continuous act of worship pursued under an unremitting and lively sense of God's providential purposes and constantly refreshed by religious activity, personal, domestic, and public. Puritans called their churches, remember this, meeting houses or conventicles, and kept them very simple so they can divert attention from the physical place to the inward spiritual nature of worship. And I can also remember this from our lecture in uh, preaching, wherein uh, the Puritans do not want their attention to be drawn to the preacher, to the one standing in front, but rather the attention should be uh, towards the inward spiritual nature of their worship. It was. It should be centered and focused to Christ, to God, and not towards themselves. So such discipline is what we, the modern Christians, have to learn from them too. So the corporate worship of the Puritans in their conventicles is basically orderly and clearly organized while being anti-ceremonial. It's anti-ceremonial. So, again, from the book, it says there, Anglican Archbishop Bancroft said that there is no religion where there are no ceremonies. Do you agree with him? On the other hand, the Puritan minister Richard Greenham claimed that the more ceremonies, the less truth. That is very true. Do you agree? So this is the typical order of their corporate worship. Confession of sins, prayer for pardon, metrical psalm, prayer for illumination, scripture reading, sermon, which is the, which is the central part of the, of the worship, corporate worship, baptisms and publication of bands, Long Prayer and Lord's Prayer, Apostles' Creed, a metrical psalm, the blessing. So there's a lot of prayer, a lot of psalms, but again, the central is the sermon. From the Greek word proskuneo, wherein the preposition pros means towards, and then kuneo means kiss, 
the Puritans believed in worship that is passionate and true. As the Bible says, that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. So they worship God with all their heart, with all their minds, and with all their soul. And they believe in the whole man religion. I heard this term from Joel Beek. He said, they ha the Puritans have this whole man worship. Joel Beek relayed that the Puritan mind will show us that all of life is worship. Uh, this worship encompasses three areas, the public worship, the familial or family worship, and the private worship. So to worship God is to bow down before his majestic, I am quoting Joel Beek, the worship, to worship God is to bow down before his majestic glory in spirit and truth, to bring him in and through and by Jesus Christ alone and according to the scriptures be honor and praise belong to him alone now Thomas Cartwright said that there are four scriptural criteria by which the details or worship fall into first that they offend not any especially the church of God that all be done in order and comeliness that all be done in edifying that they be done to the glory of God. Now, this may all sound like the Puritans make everything perfect, calculated, and everything becomes unnecessarily restrictive. Nonetheless, it is important to understand where the Puritans are coming from. Uh, their context, so to speak. What is their context? The time. So the church during their time was too corrupt and they, need, they needed a spiritual authority by which to reform the church before things get worse. All that is desired by the Puritans and I believe it should be our desire too is that God is worshipped in the way he is worthy of. I want to repeat that that God should be worshipped in the way he is worthy of. Now, John Calvin was always disappointed by fictitious worship, as we know, uh, as we read his books and materials about him and his books as well. The fictitious worship have a twofold reason why the Lord condemns and prohibits it. You see this. The first is it tends greatly to establish his authority that we do not follow our own pleasures but depend entirely on his sovereignty. And then second, such is our folly that when we are left at liberty, all we are able to do is to go astray. Well, I think this problem with, with fictitious worship was not just rampant during the Reformation time. But I guess even from the, from the early church until today. And that is very sad. You know, when we see, when we sense in the church that there is this fictitious worship. And we have that such, and, and we have such cry in our heart to end it. Right? Like how Calvin, like how Luther, like how the Puritans themselves want to end this fictitious worship in the Philippines uh, which is a Catholic Roman Catholic country if you go there you will just feel this kind of fictitious worship all around and what is very sad is that even in the so-called Christian churches as well you see there for example, this I have seen extreme Pentecostal churches and uh, churches that teach hyper grace theology. And I believe you have heard about all these things. And we can, we can mention a lot more, but it all bars down when worship becomes 
directed towards the person's desires and pleasures, the self-fulfillment. So all of this happen instead of the main thing which the Bible teaches us, and that is to bring glory to God alone. So for the conclusion, we cannot worship God unless we consider Him worthy of worship. And this is, I believe, uh, the Puritans strongly believe. And we cannot consider God, you know, we cannot consider God worthy of worship if, unless, we know Jesus Christ. And it seems that this is the heartbeat of the Puritans. And I strongly agree with them that the same heartbeat should also be our heartbeat. It is important to know that if you are a true Christian, you are to know the gospel and that through that, you will know what worship is because you already know who God is and how He is worthy of our praise how he is worthy of all the glory and i guess i mean i believe the puritans clearly understand this thing so the early church may have different outward forms and places of worship compared uh, to us today the contemporary uh, christians there even had radical intensification of worship as an inward spiritual experience among them. I also sense that the same intensity happened in the Reformation and came to clear expression in the Puritan wing of Reformed tradition. It was a pure emphasis that should not be taken for granted. The magnitude of their passion, commitment, and love for God should be something to imitate. We should imitate the Puritans, I believe, when it comes to their passion, commitment, and love for God. The Lord is holy and He deserves holiness out of us. In this, we can recall many circumstances in the Bible where God has shown His holiness to the people. And I believe it's all over the Bible from cover to cover that uh, God has proven His holiness through His love and His justice. And I would like to end with this uh, Bible verse from Leviticus, from the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, verse 3. It is about the great judgment to Nadab and Abihu. It says there, So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died in the presence of the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord meant when he said, To those who come near me, I will show my holiness, and in the sight of all the people, I will reveal my glory. God is serious about his love and justice. And as the Puritans understood it, we are to try our best to present ourselves according to the standards of the Lord Almighty. According also to the examples that Jesus Christ himself has demonstrated to us. I know it is hard. It takes a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. It takes discipline. But I believe through Jesus Christ, all things, all things are possible. And we just have to obey, to obey God um, one day at a time. That would be all. God bless you and see you again.